Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was considered good for any piece of business he chose to put his hand to. Marley was as dead as a doornail. Now I don't know what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I would think a coffin nail would be a deader piece of iron. But far be it for me to change the expression all the country's done for. So permit me to repeat once again, emphatically, that Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did! How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he had been partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and the only man who mourned him. If Scrooge can be said to have mourned at all, then the mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterward, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. What? I said, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. Christmas? A humbug? (laughs) Uncle, surely you do not mean that. Of course I mean it. Merry Christmas, indeed. What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come now, Uncle. What reason do you have to be dismal? (laughs) I mean, you're rich enough. (laughs) Bah, away with Merry Christmas. What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? (laughs) But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. A lot of good it has done you. Well, Uncle, there are many things from which I have benefited, even if it didn't show profit, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But if anything belonged to Christmas can be considered apart from the sacred source of its name and origin, I am sure I have always thought of Christmas as a, a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time of year I have known of men and women seen by one constant to open their shut-up hearts freely, and thought of others as if they were fellow passengers to the grave. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of silver or gold in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say God bless it. Another sound out of you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your position. Don't be angry, uncle. Come and dine with us tomorrow. I'll see myself in hell first. But why, Uncle? Why? Why? Let me ask you a question. Why did you get married recently? Because I fell in love, of course. Love? You fell in love? (laughs) Ha! Good afternoon, nephew. But you never came to see me before I married. Why give it as a reason not to come now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry to find you so resolute. We've never had a quarrel, you and I, but I came all this way to give you greetings for the season, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year! Good afternoon! And a Merry Christmas to you, Bob Cratchit! Thank you, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week, and a wife and family, thinking about a Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's dead. In fact, he died seven years ago this very night. Oh, I am quite sorry to hear it. But I have no doubt his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive time of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable 
that we should make some slight provisions for the poor and needy who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of basic needs. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Sir. Are there no prisons? Did they disappear? Oh no, sir. There are still plenty of prisons. And the workhouses for the poor? Still in operation, I assume? Oh, they are. Still, I... I wish I could say that they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour, then? Yes, very busy, sir. Oh, well. I was afraid from what you had said that something had stopped them in their useful course. I'm glad to hear it. Given that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer to the multitude, a few of us are trying to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink, and some means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time above all others, when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to be anonymous then? I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I am taxed for the institutions I have mentioned, and they cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. But many cannot go there, sir, and many would rather die. Oh well, if they'd rather die, perhaps they should go ahead and do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I wouldn't know anything about it. It's none of my business. I have too much of my own business to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly, and I'll thank you to leave me to it. Good afternoon, gentlemen. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power when we're gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of- Get away from here, you. I didn't ask to be bothered with that noise. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to hold back half a crown for it, you'd think you were being abused, no doubt. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Hmph! <laughs> a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have it. Be here all the earlier next morning. Oh, yes, sir. I shall. I certainly shall. Hello, my dear son. Father, I've been waiting for you. Let's go by Cornhill and watch the children play. Someday you'll be there too, playing with them. I feel that I am getting stronger every day. And do you remember what tomorrow is? Christmas Day. And I am to have the whole day off to celebrate with my family. Oh, Oh, Scrooge. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, he was. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, to be sure. Secret, self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. He carried his own low temperature with him everywhere he went. He iced his office in the dog days, and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Scrooge always took his melancholy dinner in the same melancholy tavern. And this night was no different. He read all the papers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book before he took himself home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms. It was old and dreary, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold.
do you want with me? But who are you? Ask me who I was. Right. Were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. I don't believe it. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Ha! <laughs> no! Mercy! Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must, but why have you come to me? It is required of every man that his spirit should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared, and turned to happiness. Oh, woe is me. You are fitted. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link yard by yard, and wore it of my own free will. Is the pattern strange to you, or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was as long and heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, old friend, please speak comfort to me. I have none to give. I have little time. I cannot rest. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walks beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. Oh, not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh such was I. Always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Human kind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Oh, why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Hear me, my time is nearly done. I will, Jacob, but don't be hard on me. I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance of escaping my fate. A chance I have procured for you, Ebenezer. You always were a good friend, thank you. You will be visited by three spirits. Is, is that the chance you mentioned? It is. Oh well then, I think that Robin wants. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Can't they all come at once and have it over with, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. 
Look to see me no more, and for your sake take care that you remember what hath passed between us. Oh, hum. And so, Scrooge laid his bed and thought, and thought, and thought it over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavored not to think, the more he thought. Marley's spirit bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again, like a strong spring released to its first position and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream then? A quarter past. Half past. A quarter to it. Ha! The animal itself and nothing else! Ah! Are you the spirit who's coming I was told about? I am. Who and what are you? I am the spirit of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Perhaps you could turn down that light that accompanies you? What? Would you so soon put out the light I give? Yours are the dark passions that would extinguish the light of the tree. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend. What brings you here? Your welfare, of course. I can't think of anything more conducive to my welfare than a night of interrupted sleep. Your reformation, then. Take heed, rise, and walk with me. Good heaven. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? What's what? Oh, nothing. Must have been a pimple. Lead me where you would, spirit. Do you remember the way, Ebenezer? Remember it? I could walk it blindfolded. Strange that you've forgotten it for so many years. Why, it's David Masterson and Robert Estes. Hello? These are many shadows and things that have been. They are not aware of us. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Poor boy. My mother died giving birth to my sister. My father grew morose and seemed to begrudge us both ever after. I wish, but it's too late. What is it? It's nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. Fan, little Fan, you've grown. I have come to bring you home, dear brother. Home, little Fan? Yes, home for good and all. Father is much kinder than he used to be. He was in a pleasant mood just the other night, so that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And he sent me to bring you. Ebenezer, father has arranged an apprenticeship for you. You're to be a man and begin your career. You never have to spend another moment in this dreadful school. But first we'll be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. Your sister was a frail creature. Not near, but she had a large heart. So she had. You're right about that, spirit. I'll not contradict it, God forbid. Come, Ebenezer, pack your things. The carriage is just outside. Are you sure father's ready to have me home? Oh yes, I'm sure of it. But where am I to be apprenticed? You will work for a wonderful man, Mr. Fezziwig, who keeps a warehouse. Now come, we mustn't keep the carriage waiting. Your sister died a young woman, but she did have a child, as I recall. Yes, a son, my nephew. His name is Fred Hollowell. Your nephew, Ebenezer, the only family you have left. Yes, that is true. Come along, Ebenezer. 
It is time to see another Christmas. Do you know this place? Know it? This is where I was apprenticed. Look, it's old Fezziwig, bless his heart. Fezziwig alive again. And there's Dick Wilkins, we're the best of friends. Yo ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! No more work tonight, my boys! It's Christmas Eve! Clear all this nonsense away, all of you, we must make room. Life is too short for all work and no play. I say it's time for a party! Hello, ho Dick! Turn up, Ebenezer! such a small thing, making silly people feel so much gratitude and joy. Small thing? It's enough. After all, what did he do with Fezziwig? Spent a few pounds in the party? Does he deserve such a praise as this? It isn't that spirit. Why, Mr Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy. He can make our work pleasant or miserable, just in the way he looks at us and the way he addresses us. A thousand such little things add up, you know. It's all the happiness he gives is as great as if it cost a fortune now. What is it? Nothing. Something, I think. No, no. It's, it's just that I would like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. Come, Ebenezer. My time grows short. Look! This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see. But it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was a little older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the sign of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. I know it matters very little to you. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can make you as happy as I would have tried to do, I have no reason to cry. What idol has displaced you? The golden one. Now there's a double standard for you. All the world speaks so vehemently against poverty, yet it condemns the pursuit of wealth just as harshly. You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. All your other hopes have merged into the one hope of eluding the disdain of others. I have seen your nobler virtues fall away one by one until nothing is left but one master passion, the pursuit of profit. It consumes you. What then? Even though I have grown wiser and more astute, I haven't changed my feelings towards you. Oh, Ebenezer, our promise to one another is an old one. We made it when we were young and poor and happy to remain so until we could improve our fortune together by patience and hard work. But you've changed. You are not the same man. Tell me, Ebenezer, if all of this had not happened, would you seek me out and try to win me now? A poor, dowerless girl with nothing to bring to a marriage? Just as I thought. You may feel sad now, Ebenezer, but I've no doubt that you will dismiss the thought of me very soon, as if you were glad to have awakened from a bad dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you enjoy torturing me? There is one more shadow we must see. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. Nice. Saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Oh, who was it? Take a guess. Why, surely you don't mean old Ebenezer Scrooge? The very same. I passed his office window. His partner, Jake Marley. Lies of the point of death are here, and there he sat, old Scrooge alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Miserable wretch. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you, these are shadows of the things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Please, I beg you. Take me away from here. I can bear no more. No more! After this mighty struggle, if that can be called a struggle, Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and further, of being in his own bedroom once again. He barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep.
<laughs> Scrooge! Ebenezer Scrooge! Come, come here and know me better, man. I am the spirit of Christmas present. You have never seen the likes of me before, eh? <laughs> no, never. You've never walked forth with any of my elder brothers born in these later years? No, I don't think I have. We have many brothers, spirits. Ha-ha! <laughs> More than 1,800. <laughs> Tremendous family to provide for. Come, take hold of my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Where, pray tell, are we going? You will see. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day. Is there a peculiar flavour in what you sprinkle from your torch? Oh, there is indeed. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kindly given. But to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? Because it needs it most. Spirit. Why do you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment? I? Well, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day when markets are closed, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, wouldn't you? I? You seek to close these places on the seventh day, and it comes to the same thing. I see. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family. There are some upon this earth of yours who claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill-will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us as all our kith and kin, as if they never have lived. Remember that, and change their doing on themselves, not us. What has ever got your precious father, then? And your brother Tiny Tim. And Martha was in this sleep last Christmas by half an hour. Here I am, Mother. Oh, Martha. How late you are. We had a great deal of work to finish at the milliner's last night, and a great deal to clear away this morning. Well, never mind. You are home now. Sit down and warm yourself, dear. Father will be home any minute. Hide, Martha, hide. But where's Martha? She won't be coming for Christmas this year, I'm afraid. What? Not coming for Christmas? Oh, here I am, Father. And did little Tim behave himself in church? He did. As good as gold, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see? But he's growing stronger every day. I just know it. Martha, help me with the goose. Such a goose! They're such a goose, Father. Such as we've never had before. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. I had no idea Cratchit had a crippled son. I wonder why. Tell me, spirit. Will the boy live? I see a vacant seat at this table, and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, that cannot be. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. Uh, but what difference does it make? <laughs> if he's likely to die, then let him die! and decrease the surplus population. You use my own words against me. Yes, so that in the future, perhaps you will hold your tongue until you have discovered what the surplus population is and where it is. Who are you to decide who shall live and who shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like that poor man's child. And now, dear ones, a toast. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of our feast. Hmm. 
the founder of our feast indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children. Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, when one would drink the elf of such an odious, stingy, odd, unfeeling man as Ebenezer Scrooge. No one knows it better than you, Bob. My dear, have a little charity. Oh, all right then. I'll drink his elf for your sake, and the day's sake, but not for his. Long life to him. A very merry Christmas and a happy new year, I've no doubt will be very merry indeed and very happy. To Mr Scrooge. To Mr Scrooge. To Mr Mr. Scrooge. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen, where the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even. And he said Christmas was a humbug! <laughs> and he believed it too! <laughs> More shame for him, Fred. He really is a comical old fellow. And not so pleasant as he might be, however, his uh, offences do carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred. At least, you always tell me so. But his wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do anything good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it, and I sincerely doubt he will ever consider benefiting us with it. <laughs> well, I have no pity for him. Oh, but you see, I have. Who suffers from his ill whims? Himself, always. Here. He takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He uses some good pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I mean, to give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not. I may have cracked the old boy yesterday, I do say so myself. <laughs> ah, he gives us plenty of merriment, I'm sure. And it would be ungrateful if he to his health, so... Here is to Uncle Scrooge! Uncle Scrooge! <laughs> I would normally take offence at such tasteless banter and laughter at my expense. However, in view of the general gaiety of the occasion, I am inclined to overlook it. That is quite noble of you. Forgive me, spirit, if I am not justified in asking, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding there from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? Well, it might be a claw. For all the flesh there is on it, look here. Spirit, are they yours? No, they are yours. Do you not know them? This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their kind, but most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see written the word, Doom. Unless the writing be erased, I dare ye to deny it. I dare ye to slander those who claim otherwise, and see where it leads. Are they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? I take it that I am in the presence of the spirit of Christmas yet to come. to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that not so, Spirit? Spirit, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. Will you not speak to me? Very well. Lead on, then. The night is passing fast, and it is precious time to me. Lead on, Spirit. those men and this place it's the stock exchange a second home to me no i don't know anything about it either way i only know he's dead when did he die last night i believe why what's the matter with him oh, god knows what has he done with the money i haven't heard left it with his company perhaps i only know he hasn't left it to me well it's likely to be a cheap funeral I don't know anybody who would go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if the lunch is provided. I must be fed for all the trouble it's worth. Well, it matters little to me either way. I never wear black gloves, and I never eat lunch. But I'll have to go if anyone else will. Well, 
off to business. Goodbye. 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 Have these men no sense of decency or decorum? Spirit, what is this? Why am I seeing this? I was here first. Mrs. Dilber should be after me, and then the Undertaker's man can be third. Isn't this something, Joe? All of us met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come in and sit, don't be shy. We're all suitable to our calling. We're well matched to be sure. <laughs> Come in. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true indeed. No man more so. Well then, don't stand staring as if you was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. We should hope not. Very well then. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. He wanted to keep them after he was dead, the wicked old screw. Why wasn't he more natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death. Instead of lying, gasping out his last there, all alone, by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoken, Mrs. Ornimer. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier one, and it should have been. You can count on it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else, now open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know its value to ye. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We knew pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin to see to one's livelihood. Oh, Mr. Tackleton has been a busy man. Let's see. A seal. A pencil case. Pair of sleeve buttons. Hmm. I'll give you one pound eight, not another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Ah, quite a stash, Mrs. Dilber. Of course, I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I'll ruin myself. <laughs> Three pounds even, Mrs. Dilber. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe. I was the first. Oh, and what do you call this? Bed curtains? Bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him a-lying there? Oh, why not? He wasn't apt to catch his cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Don't you be afraid of that. I wasn't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about if he did. <laughs> ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. And what do you call wasting it? Why? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. Four pounds, six shillings and tuppence. And not a penny more if I was to be boiled for it. And this is how it ends. He scared everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, this is a fearful place. Surely there can be no reason to bring me to this godforsaken part of the city, except that the case of this unhappy man might be my own. Yes, the items they have stolen are similar to mine. I see the point. But surely there is someone who feels some emotion caused by this man's death. Show me that person to me, I beg you. Oh, finally you've come, Thomas. What have you heard? Is it good or bad? It is bad, I'm afraid. Are we ruined, Thomas? Did he deny the extra time you asked for? Has he evicted us? No. There is hope yet, Caroline. Only if he repents that old miser. Nothing has passed hope of such a miracle has happened. He is past repenting, dear. He is dead. Dead? Oh, God be praised! Oh, Lord, forgive me! I thought he was merely trying to avoid me. But what I had been told is quite true. Not only was he very ill, 
but he was dying even then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we will be ready with the money. And even if we weren't, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find a creditor who is merciless as he. We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Spirit, I ask to see some emotion connected with this man's death, and you show me only pleasure. I demand to be shown some tenderness connected with a death. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And he said to them, Whenever you welcome a little child, you welcome me. This colour hurts my eyes. There, better now. The candlelight makes them weak. And I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. Not for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he's walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mum. Yes. I've known him to walk with... I've known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Very fast indeed. And so have I. And so have I. But he was very light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble at all. Is that your father now? I went by there today. It's why I'm late. I wish it could have been there. It would have done you good to see how green it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I'd walk there every Sunday to visit him, you see. But guess whom I saw today? Fred Hollowell, Mr. Scrooge's nephew. I met him on the street. He saw that I was a little down and, well, he is the most pleasant speaking man you ever heard. And so I was not afraid to tell him. And this is what he said to me. I am heartily sorry, Mr. Cratchit, heartily sorry. And he pledged to be of any service he could to us. He even gave me his card and said I should call on him at home. But it's not for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us. So much as for his kind way, that I'm thankful. It really seems as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. And I've got good news for you, Peter. What is it, Father? Mr. Rollywell told me that he's been able to secure an apprenticeship for you. You'll begin at eight shillings a week, starting Tuesday next. Eight shillings a week! Soon you'll be keeping company with a young lady, Peter, and setting up house for yourself! <laughs> That'll happen soon enough. But however and whenever we pied from one another, I'm sure none of us will ever forget poor Tiny Tim, shall we? No! Never, Father! And I know as well, my dears, that when we remember how patient and mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel amongst ourselves and forget our little Tim in doing it. No, we won't, Mother. Never. Spirit, something tells me that the moment of our parting is at hand. I know it, but I don't know how. Tell me, the man who was spoken of, the, the one who died, tell me who he was. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? The course of a man's life, if persevered in, will determine certain ends I accept it. But if he departs from those courses, the ends must change. Say it is so with what you show me. No, it can't be. Am I that man? Am I the man who died whom no one mourned? Say it isn't so, Spirit. Say it isn't so. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for your intervention. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Surely your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you show me by change life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try and keep it all the year. 
I will remember the lessons of the past. I will live in the present. I will live toward the future. The spirits of all three will strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Glad tidings we bring to you and your kin. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. What? Where am I? Wait, what day is this? It's morning, but what day? How long have I been with the spirits? I don't know. But I'm alive. I'm alive. They're still here. They're not torn down. They are here. I am here. Woo! I don't know what to do. I feel light as a feather. I'm happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Hello? You boy, what day is it? Wait, don't be afraid, my boy. What day is it? What day is it? Haha, <laughs> yes! What day is it today? Why, it's Christmas Day. Christmas Day? Are you quite sure, my good fellow? I should say I am. Then the spirits have done it all in one night. Why, of course, they can do anything they like. Of course they can. <laughs> Hello, my fine fellow. Hello? You know the polter is in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. What a wonderful boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. A pleasure talking with him. Yes, my buck. The one as big as you. It's hanging there now. It is? Why then, you must go and buy it. Yes, go and buy it now. Police! Oh, no, no. I really do mean it. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it round so that I can give them directions where to deliver it. Come back with a man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. Ha ha ha! I'll send it to Bob Cratchits. He won't know who sent it. I won't tell him. Ha! <laughs> it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Oh, Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim will live. On my soul, Tiny Tim will live. I did it all in one night. The spirits of Christmas past, present and future shall strive within me. Oh, heaven and Christmas time, be praised for this. I say it on my knees, dear Lord, on my knees. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Ha <laughs> ha. Hello. Ah, here's the turkey. Hello. How are you, my boy? I was right. <laughs> This turkey is twice the size of Tiny Tim. It's twice the size of you, my lad. Merry Christmas, my fine fellow. Merry Christmas, sir. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab, sir. Camden Town, sir? Yes. This splendid turkey is to be delivered immediately to the hob of Bob Cratchit and family in Camden Town. Here, I've written the directions down. And here is the money for the turkey. Thank you, sir. And here is the money for the delivery. Thank you, sir. And here is the money for the delivery. Thank you, sir. And here is a tip for you, sir. Thank you, sir. And here is half a crown for you, my boy. Well deserved. Yes, well deserved. Thank you, sir. And a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. My dear sir, how do you do? I hope you did well yesterday. It was a very good thing to do, a very good thing. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, that is my name. I fear it isn't pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your forgiveness. And yours too, sir. Uh, 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 yes, sir. And will you have the goodness? Lord bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you quite serious? If you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, I don't know what to say. Such generous... Don't say anything, please. Come and see me sometime. Will you come and see me, both of you? Oh, we will, we will. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you both. And a Merry Christmas. Would you believe it if I told you that Scrooge went to church that day? He did and walked about the streets, and watched the people hurrying to and fro, and patted children on the head as they passed, and questioned beggars, 
and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything at all, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps toward his nephew's house. Oh, Fred, it's beautiful. And it's too much. You shouldn't have spent so much. But I love you, my dear. And my wife shall have the best on Christmas Day. Oh, Fred, I love you so. But not just for this. I know, my dear. I know. Now, who can that be? I don't know. No one's expected at this hour. <gasps> Hello, Fred. Uncle Scrooge? The very same. It is I, your Uncle Scrooge. I recall an invitation you made to me yesterday to come and dine with you. If that invitation is still in force, I should like to accept. But, 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 but why? I, I, I don't know what to say. Well, you could say bar humbug, a retort I heartily repent of and shall never use again. Or you could say come in. Uh, c come in? I... Why, of course, of course, you should, you should come in. Hurrah, Uncle Scrooge, you've made us both very happy. May I introduce my wife, Janet? Janet, my Uncle Scrooge. My dear, it is plain to me now why my nephew chose you among women. You're indeed every bit as lovely as I have heard. Why, thank you, Uncle Scrooge. We are very happy you are here. I am sorry for the things I said about Christmas, and sorry for the poor reception I gave you yesterday, of which you were so undeserving. I see the image of my sister in your face. I loved her, you know, and she you. I know it, Uncle Scrooge. She loved you very much, and wishes until her dying day that we should always be close. And so we are, Fred, and so we shall be. So we shall be. What is this? Morning, sir. Mr. Cratchit, you are late, sir. Yes, sir. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. Step this way, if you please, Cratchit. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday with my family. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand for this any longer. And therefore... And therefore... And therefore, I'm going to double your salary. Yes, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> I'm going to double your salary, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. A Merry Christmas and I have given you for many a year. And from now on, I'll endeavour to assist your family in any way I can. And as for Tiny Tim, he will walk again. I know it. Now, you needn't say a thing. Come with me. We will discuss the particulars over a bowl of smoking bishop before you so much as dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. And ever afterward, it was always said of Ebenezer Scrooge that he knew how to keep Christmas, and keep it well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone! Everyone.